What's up, Reef Builders? Welcome to another week of Reef Recap. We will wait to, for some people to jump on here, and then we'll go into it. This episode, we're going to discuss all of this past week's content. We're going to talk a lot about reef stock, and uh, this is officially the state of the hobby, since all of you chose to watch me instead of the President of the United States. I'll be giving my state of the hobby evaluation tonight instead of the State of the Union. There's a lot of very new content that'll be coming out in the following weeks here. That's going to be extremely exciting. We recorded a, a litany of podcasts. We had videos going over our favorite corals at the studio, talking about how we can improve the studio. We visited Chris Cap's store. A lot of great stuff coming. Comments if you're here so I can begin going down the rabbit hole on something. Not sponsored. I just got a cool mug. So if any company wants to send me a mug, I'll do a different mug every single episode. I thought it was cool, and I put something kind of red in it so it looks like the Hydrospace product. But yeah, no tier list this time. Sorry for not being live uh, last week. We were recording some, some videos with Sarah Stevens, which was great. Oh, I was on private chat the whole time. Like, this is dead. There's no one talking. I see there's comments now, so that's good. Yes, I saw you commented last week, S2. You were like, where's the live stream? We were at the Butterfly Pavilion recording some very interesting stuff with Sarah Stevens. I got to see Endangered Caribbean Coral for the first time, and I, like, totally nerded out. It was, it was really cool because I got to see these species that I've never seen before. And morphologically, they're like a combination of like 10 different things that are in the industry. So uh, Usbilia was like my favorite one. It was EFAS. I can't remember the actual, like la the second name of the species, but it looked like an elegance coral, but like as a colony. What's up, Harley? Nice to meet you there. Yeah, Harley's got some very cool products coming out. He's going to he's gonna send me a tank to look at. He's, uh, I don't know if he's told people, he's going all glass now. So he's going to have some glass uh, smaller ones. So I'm going to set up uh, probably like a sponge Pico, which will be very cool. What's up, Amanda? I had a great conversation with Chris. I think we're trading some corals. So you're going to be receiving a PM from me. He wants it all to be a surprise, but I have to send you Zoas that I have, and you have to confirm if they are going, if, if he has them or not. And then I'll be sending him a box. What's up, Jack? Nice to meet you at Reefstock. Yeah, Jack is great. He got the studio ready for everyone. He's been grinding. He's been improving it. It looks really good. So there was some very cool coral there. Oh, goodness. We're getting right into it. Does hydrogen peroxide have an effect on the microbiome in a reef tank? I dose for water clarity. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so hydrogen peroxide, just free radicals in the, in the tank, right? So that's going to be cytotoxic to pretty much everything. Um, I mean, hydrogen peroxide is used as sterilizing agents, you know, when you get a cut and things like that. So if you're dosing peroxide in your tank, you're likely wiping out most anything waterborne uh, in that system. I know of some people that have sent in aquabiomics results to where they have, where they, they actually do peroxide dose. And there's a significantly lower population of Plagiobacter and Oshiosprilliae, which are two common uh, modal and waterborne uh, bacterial strains, which are very beneficial to basically everything. They can act as coral food. They can metabolize things like Dimethyl sulfonylpropionate, which is an infochemical which pathogens can use to translocate to the coral. They also will metabolize excess amino acids and nutrients in the water column, which can outcompete pathogenic strains of bacteria. So that's also the reason I don't utilize uh, UV sterilizers on tanks where I want to grow out coral. On fish-only systems, that's a, a different story. But writ large, yeah, I don't like to use peroxide for the same reason. You're adding a sterilizing agent into the water column. If you're looking for clarity only, I mean, you can use flatulence. You can use carbon in small amounts. Carbon can bind to trace elements as well. There's applications for, for carbon, one mil per 10 gallon once a week. Yeah, so even that small of a dosage is probably doing something. What's up, Jason? Yeah, Jason, Jason's a cool guy. I met him at Reefstock as well. We're going to actually have an article out pretty soon. So he makes, he makes uh, algae turf scrubbers, but he's done something I've not seen any other manufacturer do. He took a year of his tank with one of his turf scrubbers on it, and he tested – nitrates and phosphates every single day. And then he also had the dry weight of the algae when he harvested it. And you could see graphed it all at Excel. He showed it to me. We were all had taken shots and been drinking. So it was this like drunken, like 
Like it was so funny because I was just out of it. And he's like, you got to see this. And he shows me his computer and we're just sitting in the corner of the refilter studio looking at all this data and there was clear correlation. So like whenever there was a higher uh, weight, uh, dry weight of the algae that he harvested, there was a, you know, higher, there had been, there would be a larger increase or decrease in nutrients over that time. So there was a direct correlation between algal weight and decrease in nitrates and phosphates. And a lot of people have argued that maybe turf scrubbers aren't that effective because no one measures the dry weight. Is the dry weight really indicative of the nutrients that's taken out of the water column? Well, according to Jason, yeah. I told him he needs to have another year where he doesn't control and just has no turf scrubber and he can compare them. But um, it was still very interesting data. Uh, did they record you at the conference? Will that be available? Yes. I did not speak very well at the conference, though. The Colorado Air was uh, <laughs> was very bad. So I got up there to speak. I was like ready to rock. I had practiced that I had my PowerPoint. And then I couldn't say words like I wasn't nervous or anything, but um, it was like I could. It was like cotton mouth or something. I didn't have enough like my mouth was not moist at all. So I had to chug a bunch of water. And then like 30 minutes in, I was able to rebound and actually give a good speech. But yeah, it was pretty brutal. I don't even know if I want it uploaded. Um, I'm sure I'll give a better version of that speech at Aquashella or something like that. But uh, yeah, most people I talked to no, I wasn't stage fright. I I. I was, um, I've done debate and like forensics and like model UN and stuff like that all my life. So I'm pretty comfortable talking in front of people. Even right now I'm talking in front of all of you. Right. Uh, so it wasn't stage fright. It was, um, yeah, it was like a Colorado altitude thing. I mean, I was not very responsible the trip. I'd been staying up the entire, uh, time I'd been drinking a lot. So I was probably dehydrated and then I wasn't drinking water that day. So it was like bone dry. But uh, I'm sure I'll give a better version of that speech or I can even just maybe like substitute for it and I can give the speech live, you know, do an interactive thing and answer questions and we can upload that. But uh, I would say you probably there's probably not much to learn from the speech I gave. <laughs> the, we did a microscope um, lab or not like lab, but uh, workshop. And then the microscope didn't work. So I had to just kind of like pivot halfway through and I'm like, OK, let's have an open dialogue about things. Let's talk about bacteria. So even that one was a little bit sketchy. So, but at future shows, Chattanooga, I think we worked out the kinks and it'll be really good. We can upload it there, but uh, enough chit chat. I think we should get into what this week was about. There was a lot of uh, very, very interesting articles that came out this week. So first of all, Sanjay and Rich had their ICP article and it is a monster of an article. If you have not got a chance to read it yet, you should definitely read it. Uh, now they, they didn't go into what ICP test should you use. Rather, they looked writ large about, um, you know, is there repeatability that is statistically significant among the ICP tests that they sampled? And they determined that, yeah, you know, there's a small amount of error between the tests, but relatively, like, you know, they're calibrated enough to where if you stuck with the same ICP testing company, uh, you could get relatively consistent results. So many people asked, I saw it on the comments of like, why didn't you use every single ICP test available on the market? Well, it's really expensive. So first of all, to buy certified standards and also to buy a multitude of different ICP tests, that's pretty expensive. Now, that does not mean we're not open to doing that. If we want to do a community funding thing through Reef Builders, it was through Reef, um, Reef Beef before, but we could do like a dual funding thing through Reef Builders and Reef Beef. And if you all want an even deeper dive into ICP of analyzing and comparing every single ICP test, OES and MS available on the market, then we could maybe set up like a GoFundMe or something like that. Cause I'm sure Rich and Sanjay would love to be able to send out more tests and evaluate this with a much larger sample size. But just at the time, the funds were not there. So it wasn't that there was not a will, there was simply just not a way in terms of the money available, but still it was relatively useful data to show that at least if you stick with, um, you know, an ICP company, you're going to have relative, it's the same thing as like, if you use an apex and you don't calibrate it, you know, you're going to be consistently wrong if that makes sense. So, but because there's still consistency, there is, um, yeah, similarity between the results that you get, you can still tweak things in your tank relatively well. So they're not completely useless in that way. Now, how much they deviate from the standards, that would be more interesting to see, but it requires some cash. Now, another article that just came out today 
is Michael Paletta had one about coral nutrition. So specifically, he was talking about dosing ammonia, uh, ammonia bicarbonate. And then also he talked about the concoction, which I covered last time. So if you weren't here for the last episode, be sure to tune in for the last one. I kind of cover my thoughts on this whole bacterial concoction thing and uh, how I think it's quite dangerous that people are trying to culture these polymicrobial cultures at home without aseptic conditions. I mean, that to me, that seems like a fast track to grow pathogens, to have even human pathogens potentially grow. I gave examples last time of a telegram had sent me aquabiomics results of some eco balance that he had that he had opened in the past. And there was actually human pathogens that had grown from the minimal media in the, in the eco balance bottle. So if you're adding something like that unknowingly to a rich media source, it could be not just a threat to the corals and fish that you have by maybe culturing a pathogen that affects them, but it could also affect you and your family. So yeah, I do not think that that's a good way. I think that they're right that nutrition is, you know, there's a very large component of bacterial, uh, you know, heterotrophy or like, you know, nutrition that occurs with coral, but there's a much better way to do it. And I, I'll most likely have a write up highlighting maybe a better and sterile way to do something similar to this. But writ large, I think the carbon dosing, if you've got the nutrients available, is going to be able to do the exact same thing, if not better. You're going to be growing the existing populations of bacteria in your water column, which the coral can also feed on. And there's not going to be a threat of an external human pathogen in that instance. Now, coral pathogen, maybe. It depends on the existing microbiome you have, what carbon source you have, how they metabolize it, what families you're boosting. So, you know, it's always good to send in an aquabiomics result and have a, a good idea of the baseline that you're messing with. So, but uh, yeah, so I disagree with Michael Paletta on that point. I would not utilize the concoction, but I completely agree with him about dosing ammonium bicarbonate. I've been doing it for months now, as well as that going to the studio. We're going to start implementing and using it at the studio too. There's been uh, you know, just excessively low nitrates uh, in, in the systems. And a lot of the corals kind of have, um, um, God, what's the term for it? When the SPS grow too fast for the burnt tips. So some of the SPS are getting burnt tips and things like that, which is typically indicative of, uh, you know, not enough nutrition. So, but the thing is, is if you're dosing nitrates, corals can't directly utilize nitrates. They use ammonia as a nitrogen source in the wild. So if you're dosing nitrates, you're just dosing the end result of the entire nitrogen cycle, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense. Now you could get some, you know, secondary nutrition, so to speak, nutrition via proxy, because some symbionts in the corals microbial community can uptake that excess nitrogen and then feed the, like the coral can then eat them. So in a roundabout way, you can feed the coral more, but you're not directly feeding the coral what it utilizes. So if you're dosing ammonia, then you can feed the coral that nitrogen source that they can utilize. And also you still get this, uh, you know, downstream benefit of feeding the bacteria and the microbial community because they're still going to be getting nitrates. It's also a much cheaper way to dose nitrates. I can't remember the math off the top of my head, but it's, it's close to a one to 10 ratio of like one PPM of ammonia is around 10 PPM of nitrates. I think it's like 13 or 16. It's a particular number, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, so I mean, yeah, uh, Sean says, can you dose heterotrophs with carbon dosing? So like maybe, right? So, I mean, some of the more commensal strains that are used in human health that are used in a lot of these products like lactobacillus, bacillus subtilis, I am sure could probably be eaten by the coral. Now, would I like to see a product that actually uses marine bacteria? Yeah, I would. I think that that would be a, a good idea to have that because who knows what external effect that terrestrial bacteria even if they are not reproducing in the aquarium, will have long-term on the microbial population of the tank. So if you're introducing Bacillus subtilis and it uptakes all the pyruvate in the system, what happens to all the marine-associated microbes? I mean, that could cause some issues. So I, I think it'd be interesting to actually... Oh, Vanessa, I, I was going to... I can't... There's so many vulgar things I can say, but I won't. I'm on a live stream. It was nice to meet you. <laughs> Vanessa's getting me some newts. She's more in the... Uh, Herp, herp side of things, but I've been wanting to get some fire belly or alpine newts since I was like, uh, like 12. And then I finally got the cash to get them and they're banned from import. Cause there was some really weird fungal issue with salamanders and newts. Um, yeah, it was nice to meet you. I'm dead. Um, anyways, back to Sean's question. So yeah, I mean, I think a decent option would be um, using stuff like the red phytoplankton, which is a bacteria plankton, and then combining that with a carbon source. And you would probably get the same 
and a, a safer end result than the concoction, which is, I think, very dangerous. What's up, Chris? I've got some Zoa pictures coming to Amanda. So, yeah, I'm stick crazy. I got this Walt Disney, and it's got polyp extension, and I'm going crazy. So I need to get some SPS from you. If anyone else has any SPS recommendations, let me know. I don't know the names very well of SPS compared to everything else. So I, I like to see the names so I can Google them and say, oh, I like that. I don't like that. I've got a list of stuff I want to get, like Master Yoda's on there. I obviously want a home wrecker. I obviously want a rainbow splice. Um, but uh, I want some basic stuff too. I want some like organ and Cali torts. I want to get green slimer. I want to get everything. I'm going to be selling a bunch of stuff and just getting a ton of sticks. If I kill them, I kill them. But um, I'm like fairly confident in my system. Knock on wood right now. But uh, yeah, so those are the two major articles we had this week. We didn't have a ton of content uh, right now because we were at Reefstock making content for all of you to be released in the following weeks. But the ICP article and uh, Michael Paletta's ammonia article are both very interesting this week. Like I said, I will be responding to the ammonia article with uh, a lot more data to back up ammonia dosing, but also arguing and debating with Michael Paletta, um, you know, about if we should be doing the concoctions. So if you want to see old school versus new school on the Reef Builders team, butting heads, there you go. The dirty insanity I keep hearing about. Chris told me all about it. It might be one I have to get. If I can keep like, if I get like growth on the Disney, if I get like a home wrecker or something more expensive and I don't kill it in like two months, I'll probably then get a rainbow splice, dirty insanity, like a vivid insanity, Maybe I'll just try Speciosa too. I'll probably just go full kitchen sink and get everything. And uh, speaking of kitchen sink, one of the videos we're going to have coming up next is analyzing the kitchen sink tank in the Reef Builder Studio. It was certainly my favorite tank there. So this was the one. It's got the grafted tube and area in it. It's got some like LA Lakers scroll coral. There's a couple of really interesting birds nest in there. It kind of was a kitchen sink. It had quite a few different species that were thrown into it that had all grown are grown to uh, colonies and the time in the studio, you know, has been taken care of. And we kind of went in a deep dive with it. We talked to Jack about his favorite corals in there in terms of what, uh, you know, he's doing to maintain it as well as some of his favorite species. And little birdie told me maybe uh, Remy and I will be getting some frags from that tank to put in our own system. So we'll have a little series updating who can grow things faster, Remy and I. We're going to have a little bit of a race uh, showing if, who can grow things faster. I think that Remy will probably keep them alive. I'll probably end up killing the SPS, but uh, we, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I said if I kill them, I kill them. Yes, I don't want to kill them, but uh, that's part of the hobby. It's part of learning. I'm sure if I get a bunch of SPS and I end up uh, killing the SPS, then I will learn a lesson from that. I'll be able to deduce what I did wrong and then learn from it. So, you know, what, what's nice is I will be getting aquaculture pieces, not things that are taken from the ocean. So having clones of things and reintroduce, like, you know, introduce them to tanks allows for people to learn. So if I can learn some tricks with keeping SPS, then I can share that with all of you because I've never done SPS before. I've done about everything else. So it's not that I don't care about killing them, but it's that I know that if I do it, I can potentially learn from that and hope to have a dialogue about it. So I do run calc. Yes, I hopefully I'll be fine. <laughs> I run calc and then I also have uh, sodium hydroxide. So pH gang, 8.4 plus only 10 frags left and I'll have colonies left to regrow better. Get it next week. Ah, I guess we will have to trade by next week then, Chris. I'll have to go to the airport and send you a box. Why should I trust you if you can't grow SPS? Sanjay can grow SPS. Ah, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> maybe you should not trust me. That's the whole skepticism thing I've been talking about anyways. So. But uh, no, I think I could probably grow SPS. I've just never done it. As a college student, I've not invested in them because I know that it's harder to get a return on that investment. I've grown Zoas, high-end Zoas. I've grown Euphilia. I've grown a, a lot of chalices, things that are a much hardier, which I know I can get a return of my investment on. And I've been able to get a return on. But, uh, you know, I've been, you know, I think it's time. I think it's trying to, time to try SPS. So something that I want to talk about that I planned out at Reefstock, which will impact all of you and the hobby writ large. I talked, we had a couple of beers and Dr. Eli Meyer and Dr. Andrew Bauma from Oregon State both had a very in-depth conversation. So these are the guys that are with the Aquabiomics team. So the company where you send in a sample and you get the whole microbiome back. So obviously I've been a very large proponent of using that technology to 
you know, expand our understanding of our systems and to try to push push the envelope even further. Beyond just ICP, we now have a way to test the biological side of things and the, you know, in terms of the minutia and potentially change those things. So many of you have asked me through consultation or just on here, what do I do if I have this pathogen? Or what do I do if um, I want to increase this family and my tank? And Eli, Andrew, and I are going to try to determine the answers to those questions. And this is best done, we think, through a community science approach. So instead of us just going and messing with it, we're going to have an open source program to where you can go and get aquabiomics test, two of them, a before and an after, and you will evaluate a certain question for your tank. Now, this involves controls, right? So you basically need to keep excuse me, everything the same for like a week or two, a month even, for some of these things, and then have one thing you're changing in the tank. And we are interested in seeing the before and after the microbiome after that single change. So the first thing we're going to explore is carbon sources. Now, number one thing is we want people that do not run a UV sterilizer because UV sterilizers can knock out a lot of those waterborne families, which we are interested in increasing the concentrations of. So if you do not utilize a UV sterilizer and you're interested in this, PM me. But we're going to be having a small sample size at first, people who are dedicated, who have successful reef tanks, who have experience in the hobby and who really want to push the boundaries and begin answering these questions. So we'll have carbon, sugar, vodka, a couple of uh, interesting ones that Eli and I have been you know, going down the rabbit hole about in terms of literature out there. But the hope is that we can find a carbon source that can actually shift the microbiome in a preferable way. So potentially a carbon source that some of these more uh, beneficial guys can metabolize better or more exclusively or competitively than a lot of the, you know, the pathogenic or opportunistic, or <laughs> opportunistic strains of bacteria. This would then give hobbyists a tool to expand and modulate their microbiome in a very easy way without buying some thousand dollar bottle from a company where they don't list what's in it. You could simply carbon dose a selective carbon source and then modulate the microbiome. So obviously we want to have the community do this, an assortment of different tanks, all with different microbiomes. And the goal is to get a very large sample size of community volunteers. And then over time, even though they can all be different microbiomes, we may see trends emerge with even these ones had distinct baselines because they added this carbon source. The end result was the same. We saw an X percentage increase in this family. So, I mean, that's the number one thing we're going to be exploring right now is carbon sources. We're going to evolve beyond that. We have a lot, lot more questions we want to answer, but we figured that it would be great to get the community involved with something like this because then we can all learn and all begin to explore these questions together. And obviously it's not things that we can do on their, our own. UV sterilization is important with LED systems only. So I assume you are saying that because you feel that UVB from metal halides or T5s could lead to some sterilization in the water column. I'm not sure about that, if that is your claim. I think that you could potentially see residual effects to where you could knock out some bacterial populations. But I think that even having UVB on a shallow tank is not going to have the same effect as UVC. Because, I mean, UV, having UVC with a long exposure time with the whole spiral design can really just, you know, cause a massive amount of mutations which prevent uh, reproduction later on. Whereas UVB can be, you know, carcinogenic as well. But it's not going to be as 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 much as like those lower lower bandwidths. So uh, yeah, balanced miner and traces has have helped us eliminate carbon dosing. Yeah, so obviously I agree with that. I don't think the carbon dosing is absolutely required, you know, for nutrient management or, or anything like that. But rather, we're interested in it by you know through changing the microbial populations. So yeah, but I don't I don't like to use UV. I think UV can be important for fish only systems, but I think I opt for a more naturalistic or ecological approach to where one is trying to increase the concentration of those waterborne benign bacteria, which can act as a coral nutritional source and metabolize some of the known infochemicals that cause pathogenic events. So while you could go the route of nuke it all, I like the route of, uh, you know, try to have a, have balance. So, 
Jake and I used gin for a little bit back in the day because we were out of vodka. That'd be cool. Something we talked about was Jack Daniels. Something we also talked about was Coca-Cola. Um, this is one we're going to explore. Uh, Sarah Stevens was telling about this guy and he works for like some public aquarium, right? And they had like a 30,000 gallon system they were trying to cycle and they hit a plateau in the nitrite phase. So they couldn't get any bacteria to eat the nitrites and convert them to nitrogen gas or to nitrates. So this guy figured out that Coca-Cola had the perfect amount of phosphoric acid <laughs> and, and other assorted chemicals to where you could add it and it would then accelerate the growth of all those nitrite metabolizing bacteria and get them over the plateau. And it was also the cheapest option because phosphoric acid is very, very expensive. So they were able to buy like, you know, a, a, a thousand liters of Coca-Cola and pour it in this 30,000 gallon tank. And then it overnight, it cycled. It completely cycled overnight. And Sarah used this, the butterfly pavilion as well and had success with it. So <laughs> I really want to test some of those goofy ideas like that. Like we were joking, like, okay, so Coca-Cola can be a phosphoric acid source. What's our carbon source? Obviously, um, you could use Jack Daniels. So we could have Jack and Coke in the tank. <laughs> so... Yeah, I had never heard of that before. It was pretty pretty interesting. Biodiversity sounds better in a system to make it hardier. Same concept as having a bigger system that makes it more stable. So, like I say, I'm not advocating for biodiversity for biodiversity's sake. Rather, having the right families, having the right diversity. So, for example, endozoicomonas. Roseobacter, which is a member of the Rhodobacter ACA that's non-pathogenic. You can have the Pelagiobacter, the Oshiosprilliae. These four are four very well-described symbionts that can really aid in the coral immune response as well as nutrient cycling. There's some Rhodobacter ACA that are associated with uh, the coral internally, which can also aid with nutrient cycling to where they are diazotropes and can eat nitrogen and then you know pass it onto the coral as a nutritional source. So it's not really just throwing in as many bacterial products or like sources of live sand as possible, but rather getting a baseline through something like aquabiomics and then seeing how can we push these populations in one way or the other to basically change the microbiome to have a higher concentration of those known good guys. So yeah, it, it's not just like the concoction angle where you're throwing everything in a bottle with a carbon and amino acid source and throwing it in your tank. It's a much more controlled and scientific way of going about analyzing the families that are there and trying to find ways to change the concentrations of those families, pushing them in a better direction. Who is my favorite speaker in reef stock? I actually only got to uh, catch Kevin's speech and it was, it was pretty cool seeing all the stuff they're doing at Ames. He was like, yeah, we got a blank check to do all this. We've got Heat resistant trains of zooxanthellae were infecting with coral. We've been able to infect coral with strains of zooxanthellae they typically don't uptake, which was extremely interesting to me because I've not heard of anyone doing that. So it was pretty interesting to see what they're doing down at Ames and see the extent of the projects they're doing for conservation. And it really gave me a lot of hope that, um, you know, coral might be able to survive in my lifetime, maybe even past it. Maybe we could have an ad adaptive approach to climate change where coral can, um, you know, have, have more heat, you know, tolerant strains or be genetically engineered or whatever mechanism it's through to survive different oceanic conditions. But I mean, yeah, it was, it was a pretty interesting talk for sure. I can't wait till everyone else is uploaded because there was quite a few talks I wanted to see that I didn't get to see. I really wanted to see Tarasas. I wanted to see, I wanted to see everyone's pretty much like <laughs> I, I really wanted to watch them all, but I had a booth. I was making content. I had uh, too many irons in the fire. I'll probably not sell coral uh, next time because it would have been great to watch those videos. Uh, Vanessa said Coca-Cola in the glass bottle or the can. So that was something we wanted to explore, right? You can have corn syrup, sugar, or aspartame. We could have Diet Coke, like the, the glass bottle Cokes or the can of Coke. Would any of those have a different effect on the microbiome? So that would be uh, <laughs> that would be pretty funny. I'm bourbon dosing myself right now. My fish and coral seem to be jealous. Yeah, bourbon dosing is pretty good, man. I, I'm not. No, I'm. I'm not going to drink tonight. I'm not going to go that low. I've got. I've got some Gatorade in here. We're not going to do the drinking thing ever again. Can aquabiomics use be used as a veterinary diagnostic? Maybe right. I mean, the technology is extremely accurate, but to to, to have diagnosis and to deploy antibiotics. 
you know, from any any amount of data when the microbial world is so complex in terms of coral. These are all polymicrobial infections, often which occur from a dysbiotic event where many of the coral's beneficial symbionts become opportunistic and then become pathogenic. To then go and say, I'm going to use Cipro in the entire tank, even if you have data suggesting that Vibrio or uh, Arcobacter are present, some of these gram negatives that could be affected, that's a very slippery slope and will result in a residual power vacuum, which could then cause, you know, even bigger fish to come into play and then cause a pathogenic event. The most important thing to remember with any infection that occurs in coral is that it will always begin with an abiotic stress response. So the, the best, you know, a, a, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. The best way to go about things is to have stability and chasing stability in whatever way you can, whether that's ICP and having the traces in line or just the macro elements, uh, your big three. And th those are the most important things to ensure uh, that a pathogenic event does not come into play. Having a very reliable test kit, like uh, Meckley was talking to me about some very interesting test kits that that um, he was using. I think it was like IDIP is what he called it. But, you know, that, that might be something to look into. I'll probably write an article about that. Obviously, salifert is something that is accurate, but it is not, you know, it, it's not the right values, but it is consistent over time. But yeah, I mean, utilizing antibiotics, that's very slippery slope with diagnosis or without. Prophylactically is even worse, I think. Resistance is real and it's very scary. What was my biggest takeaway from the Reef Builder Studio? Hmm. Well, it was pretty cool. <laughs> it was really nice seeing that many tanks put together with that many unique corals. I mean, I was just very impressed by the diversity of corals there. Like, I mean, there was so many rare species that I've not really seen anywhere else. Like the Manila spy, there was that branching echinopora. Like there was stuff that was just so unique, all the snake polyps. So I kind of got to nerd out about the diversity and the, um, the rarity of the corals there. But also I think that it was, it, it's a pretty, pretty massive task for Jack. I was really like, wow, Jack's the man. He's maintaining all these tanks on his own. I mean, that's like a, that's a full-time job to have to maintain that many tanks. I mean, I've got like seven tanks at home, but they're all smaller. So, I mean, it's, it's already a full-time job here. I barely have time to do it. So to take care of that many large systems, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of work. So shout out to Jack. There's a lot of cool coral there. And I think it's got potential to really have, um, you know, even, even better growth, even better coloration. Obviously, it's coming back from, from Jake's absence, but I think that we're on the right path and it's going to look great. It already looks way better and it's looking pretty good. And I think in a year from now, it's going to be back on track and look absolutely amazing. And we could maybe begin acquiring more unique corals that would be something that Jake would have liked to include in those tanks. I think that that would be you know, the next step forward is thinking, would Jake you know, appreciate this being in the studio? Is this a really interesting or unique piece we're not seeing anywhere else? that we could include that would, you know, fit the existing mold of the Reef Builder Studio. So it was something like a museum to all of Jake's work. And I thought it was very cool. It was very nostalgic for me and very, it was almost like this like, like fever dream because I couldn't believe that I was standing there after I had watched these videos for like my entire time in the hobby. It was, it was a really, really cool moment to get to look over the logo and be like, wow. Um, I've not seen that, but like I said, I, I certainly, I don't like to add them because of those bacterial species. I don't think that it would straight up crash a tank by any means. There's plenty of successful tanks that use UV sterilizers, but I think that you could be converting your corals to like a carrier state to where their microbiome could be out of whack enough to where it'll only take one abiotic swing to then cause a pathogenic event. So corals can be carriers for disease as well to where they don't have expressed symptoms yet, but they still have the preconditions in a microbial sense for those symptoms to be expressed for things to be lit on fire. So, you know, like I say, having that balanced and beneficial microbial community, which I think a UV sterilizer harms. Yeah. No mention of the margaritas. I don't know what you're talking about at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had a great conversation with uh, Meckley and Sanjay till like, well, I think Meckley, what was it, like 2 a.m. we stayed up? <laughs> like we, we'd all been drinking, and um, Chris was talking about some very interesting experimental things he's doing with a certain type of food in his systems 
And it was very cool just hearing like three generations of the hobby kind of kind of talk about things. So Sanjay had his opinions and Chris had his and I had mine. And it was interesting for me personally to view, like I could understand the opinions of everyone there. I disagreed with some of them, right? But I also could understand their rationale and I could see how for a very long time it could be it was it was a very good you know source of logic but we talked about a lot and then chris and i talked to like three in the morning and talked about a ton of crazy stuff <laughs> so it was it was a great conversation the best thing about reef stock was getting that reef uh reef beef experience so how they always describe like you know reef bomb or reef beef is uh what we do at, sto at uh, shows we all stay up till four in the morning we drink we smoke we whatever and we just talk about the hobby I got to experience that firsthand with a lot of very big names in the hobby, and um, it was great. There was a lot of very interesting conversations over time. Yeah, so apparently, if there's enough consumer demand, Raj is going to take me and Remy and Ben and Rich to Fiji because Ben and I have never actually seen anything besides a Caribbean reef. We've never seen, which is like fire coral, gorgonians, and sadness, right? <laughs> At least right now. So, yeah, um, Raj and Rich were like, we should take, we should take Ben and Salem to a real like Fiji reef and just have their minds blow and make a bunch of content while we're there. So, if you guys want to see us to go to Fiji or any reef, drop below where you want to see us go. What's your opinion on freeze dried bacterial products versus liquid? So, first, I think you would need to evaluate what your goal is by adding them. Is it a food source? Are you trying to decrease nutrients? Is it snake oil to where you think you're going to solve all your problems and there's no proof of that? These are all things that are on the market, all three of these. I think that some of the freeze – so obviously also there's freeze-dried to where the colony-forming unit, units can come back to life, right? So like the Benepets food, all of the colony-forming units in that are freeze-dried and then resuscitate in the water column. But I also have seen foods that are, you know, sterilized. They're dead. It's just bacterial. It's kind of like the freeze-dried phytoplankton stuff, like phytofeast, like the old school stuff. So, I mean, there could probably be a nutritional source from some of the freeze-dried items like that. But if you're adding in any product, any bacterial product, you need to evaluate what you're adding and why. And I think the majority of companies out there cannot tell you why that should be. And I don't think that these things should be added just to add them at all. I think that could be relatively dangerous. You could shift your microbiome in ways we don't yet understand. Like, why are we adding lactobacillus and bacillus subtilis to our tanks? Why are we adding, like, you know, strains that are utilized in human probiotics to our tanks? Because a company saw them, they could commercially buy them, and they wanted to make money off of it. Yeah, that seems like a great reason, you know. But there's not a, there's not really much rationale scientifically behind adding these things. It's most of it is just a marketing push, and uh, I don't really agree with it kind of takes advantage of a lot of people's ignorance about these topics. And uh, I think it's pretty slimy. Speaking of slimy, bio pellets. Yeah, better option, I think, right? You're at least growing the bacteria that are already in the tank by giving them a carbon source and an area to colonize. It's kind of old school method, right? I mean, it's better to use that if you've got pretty, pretty high nutrient levels, but it's a tool you can use, you know, carbon dosing, that's a tool you can use. There's plenty of tools, plenty of ways to skin every cat out there. So, you know, that's that. But, you know, I, I don't really use many bacterial products in my systems at all. I'll use live sand, live rock, things like that if I want to seed things. The coral obviously have symbionts on them. Sometimes I will use hydro space. It's at least, it's at least better because Ken is transparent about what strains are in it. He says, here's what they do. Here's what they don't do. That's a little bit better than most companies out there. There's at least some data that shows that some of these strains can be associated with coral. At the very least, they can at least be diazotrophic and take up nitrates uh, in the water and have like a bioremediative property, which is just like the, the clean products. So let's say, let's see. Say I have a bunch of LPS, but now a single mushroom survive my tank. Um, what species of mushrooms have you tried? How old is your tank? Where are you placing them? Those are three questions. Let's see. I found the bio pellets. You only need an eighth of the recommended. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> bio pellets are pretty hardcore. If you're going to do it, then uh, I would definitely underdo it because, yeah, they can really strip a tank of things. That is for sure. It is a very aggressive approach. 
What coral should I put in a room temp tank? A lot of the Western Australian species would be good options. So like button scolies, um, you can get like the astrophilia, like the Wilsonis. Those are really cool. I've had luck with those um, in, in lower temperature tanks, like 72, 68 to 72. I've seen them do a lot better. They keep their coloration better. But I mean, a lot of corals can be kept in a little bit of colder water. There's a, a couple of tanks in Europe that don't run heaters at all that have very successful tanks. Now, who knows if they could be better in warmer water, but they can at least handle it, reproduce, and thrive in those temperatures, relatively speaking, at least that we can see with our eyes. So like acanthophilia and things like that. Um, other options of things you could do in room temp tanks are some of the deeper water non-photosynthetic Caribbean or Pacific Gorgonians. So like the Swiftia, that's a really cool species from the Caribbean. Those naturally come from a little bit cooler waters because they are deeper. Um, I run my tank at 76. I usually run it like a little bit colder anyways, because it'll limit some of the pathogenic bacterial growth, it limits all bacterial growth, but it gives you a little bit more of a, a um, response time to really big issues. And most corals don't mind it. So yeah, I run my tank cooler anyways, but room temperature, I've done um, I've done NPS at room temperature. So like dendronephia, scalarionephia, the um, chromonephia, which are a dendronephia subspecies, some of the sun corals. So a lot of those guys are kind of deeper typically on the reefs as well. They seem to do well with cooler water. If you want to do like real cool water stuff, you can get some of those Japanese deep water anemones. I can't remember the actual Latin name. It starts with an H. But they are very, very cool. They're NPS, but they're easy to keep. You just feed them. You know, it's like any of the, like, it's like sun coral level of NPS, but they're bright, bright, screaming green. And they're, they come from deeper water. So you could do those as well. Most softies would probably be fine. So, how did your coral show sales go at Reefstock? And when can I get some of those spectral hornets? Went all right. I should have brought more lower end stuff. It was a kind of more middle of the road market. So I brought 50% really high-end ballers. So I had like an HG colony and like a big like OG bounce and stuff. And then I had 50%, which was just like cheaper stuff, like five for a hundred. And I sold mostly the cheaper stuff. Um, I sold a couple high-end pieces though. But if I were to do it again and come to the Denver area, I'd probably just bring a bunch of excess uh, overgrowth I have and just blow it out. You know, it's probably what I would do. So I think it seemed like a pretty decent show for everyone. <laughs> Give Remy nothing. Remy has given me the world. He's given me a shoulder to cry on, his expertise, his opinions. He's He's been my producer behind the scenes. I, I owe Remy a spectral hornet, probably a beer, quite a few things. Are you going to bring a mix to the swap in St. Louis? Uh, I'm probably going to bring cheap stuff to blow out because uh, I don't really want to bring high ends and stress them out again. You know, if there's a request for higher end stuff, I'll bring it. But I'm, you know... I don't really want to stress out an HG colony again by bringing it and then having it not sell. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the hornets are nice. The spectral hornets are very nice. I sold out of those. I have to grow them back out. Uh, Josh got one. Ben from BSA got one. Meckley was drooling at one. Remy was drooling at one. Everyone seemed to like them. I do phytoplankton when I have time. So I've been busy with school. A lot of things like that. So whenever I get time to set it up, I'll grow some phyto. I always have pods. I feed my pods some bacterial cultures. That's a little something I'm experimenting with. So I don't have to have phyto to grow those. But uh, yeah, I'm probably going to do some phyto this week because I need to. Pretty over over um, the time of doing it at this point. It's been like a month. Top three skimmers and dosing pumps. I'm not the person to ask. <laughs> I'm reefing on a budget. All the stuff that I get, I get through trades. Or I buy the cheapest stuff. So I could tell you, but it's going to just be regurgitation. And there's probably a lot better people to ask about that. I've heard the GHL dosers are really good, but I don't have one. Two-year-old tank, green or of Florida mushroom for Thane, found an overhang of my rocks, babe, on the sand bed. Huh. What happens? Like, does it slowly die over time? Or do you have a die pretty fast? Does it bleach? Does it kind of jelly up? Kind of like just, you know, melt? What happens there? Because I have one theory based on what you said already, but I need to know that information. But there, there's something that might be happening there with where you've placed it, maybe. But yeah, this was just kind of like a little recap stream. We missed last week. I figured I'd talk about restock, a lot of the cool stuff we're doing. You know, be a good conversation. Yes, slowly turning white. Okay. 
So here's the hot take. I don't like to place corals on sand beds. Maybe something like a trachea or an acanthophilia, which is just like they're in mud. They love it, right, in nature. But even even a lot, like even them, right, at least anecdotally, I have had better success not placing them on the sand bed. So I have something of a theory for why this is. So it's with the whole, you know, pathogenesis thing. If you think about it, the coral has an ideal microbiome that it keeps, you know, the right, in the right concentrations. You've got endozoicomonas and roseobacter, which are top level regulators, which are controlling the populations of everyone else that could become opportunistic and blocking the bad guys from getting in. When those die off, you have a lot of problems that can happen. So the sand bed is a place where a lot of the bad guys can live. So there's an excess of surface area. Every single grain of sand presents a ton of place for like a bacteria to grow. So even more than the pores in your live rock. As well as that, the sand tends to clump together, can have anaerobic regions. So this presents a perfect environment for a lot of bio, anaerobic and biofilm producers to live. So if you think about it, even if you have a plug, if you have a coral on a plug, if it's even close to the sand bed, if the sand blows on it, if it's even in residual contact with the sand bed, what you have is essentially a microbial war. You have all of these opportunistic bacteria, which are typically pathogenic or coral pathogens that live in concentrated areas in the sand. And then you have all the good guys. And if even a single grain touches, I mean, that's like D-Day happening right there. There's an invasion that's occurring. So over time, you're going to probably see a very slow recession and degradation of the typical immune responses of the coral. So that, you know, other times they're going to happen a lot more rapidly. So that's kind of like the STN versus RTN thing that happens, right? So if you're seeing a very slow bleaching of it over time, Typically, bleaching will be associated with the buildup of reactive oxygen species in the coral, where corals will generate free radicals as a general response to pathogenic infection or abiotic stress. Now, these can kill all the bad guys, but they also kill the good guys, and it's also cytotoxic to the coral's tissue. So if you have continued, you know, um, like basically immune challenges, then there's going to be a continued buildup of reactive oxygen species, and that can also lead to a build up in things called danger signals, which then means the coral can recognize the zoosanthelae as other instead of self, and they can reject them. That's like a whole very complex thing. I have an article about the coral immune response on reef builders. But uh, yeah, I moved it around on the sand, sand bed, but not vertically. So I would try a recordia again, place it lower in the tank, still lower par, lower flow, like mushrooms love, but don't place it on the sand bed. Place it on the rock work and see if you have more success. Now that's just my thoughts right now based on what you said, but typically any corals that I place on the sand over time, they're going to die like that. So let's see. So there's other questions. I see plate corals in the sand and shake my head. They live on hard, rocky reef slopes. Yeah. Every fungia, heliofin fungia, cycloceris, diaceris, whatever, any of the plate corals I've had, they will melt on the sand. And in the beginning, I never understood it. But looking at things now, yeah. Any good books for dummies on microbiology that you recommend? Any for terminology? Um, no books I can think of. I'm sure that there are some. I'm sure there's actually like a microbiology for dummies book. Um, that It would probably be a really good resource. But typically Khan Academy, like a lot of like the tutoring resources on YouTube are great ways to learn about these concepts and terminology. So yeah, uh, Khan Academy, Organic Chemistry Tutor, which... Yeah, organic chemistry tutor sounds like it's about organic chemistry, but he does all the STEM classes. So he does like computer science, everything. He's one of the better like people on YouTube for uh, STEM subjects. But uh, yeah, sounds like in the whole a hole in the market for some reef microbial microbiome. Say on your next project. Yeah, probably. I've got a lot of projects already. Um, one of them, which will be announced uh, next month, so stay tuned. But we will have a very large amount announcement for things I'm working on uh, next month in reef builders. So. Can coral be treated with antioxidants? Hmm. Probably, right? I've thought about this before. Like maybe you could directly add catalase enzyme or like super dioxide mutase to a sick coral, right? Because those are the two enzymes that are typically expressed to deal with free radicals in a coral's tissue. Now, I found one peer-reviewed article where someone where, where they actually added catalase to sick coral and it ended up killing the coral. 
So <laughs> they don't really know the mechanism for why that is. My thought is most likely that um, at, at the point to where you're wiping out all the free radicals that the coral generates, you are also significantly bottlenecking its immune response. So obviously some amount of free radicals needs to be, needs to be produced to resolve that potential immune challenge. But uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, but that would be something that needs to be tested and really, really experimented with. And at least in terms of the data so far, yeah. Yeah, people used to dose vitamin C. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure if that was for the antioxidant or for, you know, it is a cofactor. No one really that I ever saw had a good reason for why that was. But, you know, could come back. I think a lot of the aminos and like just a balanced diet takes care of any of those benefits. So if you've got... Like for instance, so like the red phytoplankton, the bacterial plankton, like Rhodomonas, it has carotenoids. Carotenoids are an antioxidant. You could dose them that way, and it's also a nutritional source. Maybe a little bit better than a um, an actual like enzyme or antioxidant purified. My plate coral is thriving on the sand and spitting out babies. Yeah, no, it could certainly happen. I'm not I'm not here to say that 100 percent of the time it's going to die, but I am going to say that often I have more success, and I've had more success in the shops I've worked in not keeping corals on the sand bed. You can always get lucky, but in terms of overall trends I have anecdotally experienced, I tend to not be lucky in that instance. So you never know, right? I am not sure where tongue corals are in nature, but like I say, even acanthos, even trachees, things that do live on the sand bed, I will avoid placing them on the sand bed simply because the microbiome in our tanks, any of the pathogens are going to be there most likely. So even if in nature they are adapted to living on the sand bed and maybe are more resilient to that different microbial community, in a closed loop ecosystem to where you have a concentration of pathogenic bio, like, you know, biofilm producers in the sand, I would rather not take that chance. Put them on some egg crate, put them on a rack. or So, you know, a rock, rack, same thing. <laughs> What's your experience on hair algae and bright by process and how to deal with it? So I don't want to say fluconazole. That's like last resort, right? You could use fluco as an absolute last resort, but hair algae and by process, hair algae, a lot of things will eat. Sea hairs will eat it. Turf algae is different. Turf algae is a little bit of a different beast. And sometimes, you know, you could really, really have trouble beating it. By process is also a problem typically. Now you could do like spot treatments with per, with peroxide. You could try juvenile emerald crabs. They will sometimes go after hair algae or turf algae rather. Um, getting your nutrients in a better concentration. So something like sending out an endoc test and seeing the ratio of organic to inorganic carbon, that can sometimes be very useful. And then you can carbon, carbon dose and things like that to push it in a different direction. Um, on top of that, having your trace elements in the proper concentration. So like getting your halogens in line can really help, um, having higher magnesium concentrations can maybe help anecdotally. I keep my systems at 1500 basically always because high magnesium, it acts like a regulatory chemical for basically all redox reactions. So the higher you have that up until a precipitate point, uh, the more stable, most all reactions are in a reef tank is kind of my rationale for doing it. But yeah, I would try to like correct traces, correct organic versus inorganic carbon, try to add some herbivores, potentially do like a turf scrubber or a fuge to outcompete it somewhere else with a higher par value on that other beneficial algae source. So it's more favorable to grow there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, those are the things that I would look at then potentially magnesium. And then you could always do spot treatments with peroxide. I would use fluconazole as a last resort simply because fluconazole could probably knock out some of the beneficial fungal uh, symbionts that are, you know, with coral. And there's a lot of those. And that's not something that I've talked about a lot, but there's a lot of data there to show that fluconazole can really mess some things up. And the, the fungal good guys are just as important as the bacterial good, good guys. And that's something that really no one has really talked about. So yeah, fluco is a last resort, but there's plenty of ways to maybe deal with it without that. Oh, that's interesting, Nick. I've not pushed it that high, but I can really see that working. Maybe I'll do it in a nano. I've got a nano where I've really just had higher nutrients and I've let things uh, go rampant. So I'll dose the mag up this week and see what happens. That's interesting. You're going up against the state of the union. What's the state of the hobby? Are you wearing pants? Ah, so yeah, the state of the hobby. 
think there's a lot of snake oil. I think there's a lot of misinformation. I think there's a lot of people who are ignorant about things that are trying to probably take advantage of you. Either I don't think maliciously. I think it's just they're trying to make a business. They don't know about a lot of things, and then that can cause uh, some issues. So something that I would like to do going forward with reef builders is have more transparency. So bringing attention to the science, bringing attention to peer-reviewed things and applying them to the hobby. So you can see already we've been doing this this week. So we had the ICP article out. So um, yeah, reef builders, you know, angle. We're going to have the community science stuff with aquabiomics we're going to be doing. Pretty hardcore. We're going to be pushing a lot of those projects. And all of my content is going to be based on peer-reviewed articles and breaking them down and trying to answer a lot of the questions that people have. So this week I'll have one about dosing ammonia and going through the whole pathway of how coral utilize ammonia as a nitrogen source and showing data, um, you know, that ammonia is a little bit better than dosing nitrates, things like that. So in terms of state of the hobby, I think uh, what I'm wearing pretty much sums it up. So I look pretty nice up here, right? But uh, look at this. Oh, no. I'm making a mess out here, Remy. I've got my pajama pants on. You would have never known. Tip of the iceberg type of stuff, right? So not all is what it, you know, not all out there is what it seems to be. Skepticism, you know, Rich Ross's whole thing is something that should really be applied. I think people should be a lot more skeptical about what they're putting in their tanks. I think that most people should be pushing and buying products that are transparent with what's in them. So, you know, there's a lot of good stuff out there that where they tell you what is in the product. If they don't tell you what's in it, who knows what you're adding to your tank? It's the exact same concept as don't dose what you're not testing for. Why would you dose something that a company just <laughs> – yes, I am wearing pants. <laughs> I, w I wasn't going to not wear pants. That would have been horrendous. I won't do that to all of you. But, yeah, the entire point was basically just don't take things at face value from companies. Be a little bit skeptical. Be uh, diligent about what you put in your tank and consider why you're adding what you're adding. Don't just add things because an influencer told you to. Add things because there is a biological or chemical reason to add them, to maybe help the coral or the fish or whatever it is in your system be healthier. That's kind of how I do my tanks. It's not a KISS method because you can obviously get pretty crazy and add a lot of really weird things uh, to solve specific issues, but also it, it is. I mean, it's it's keeping it simple in terms of only adding what you, you know, you know, only adding things like only adding controlled amounts of things where you know what you're adding instead of an unknown. They could push trace concentrations in a different way, could push the bacterial populations in a different way. Who knows what is out there? Many products might be like this clean cut, but they're wearing pajamas. So, what test kits do I have? I have a Trident that I calibrate, I have the Hannah stuff for nutrients, but. I, I kind of want to do this whole eye dip thing that Meckley's talking about. He kind of sold me on that. So I know that um, Salifert is very consistent. Maybe not accurate, but very consistent. That's a good one. But the, the most important thing is if you have a test kit, doing it really well. So if, you know, if you've got titration, do it the same way every time. Be, com be consistent with your testing. That's the most important thing. Aptasia. Bergia are great if you don't have like rasses and things like that. That's the easiest solution is Bergia. Um, you could use like the F Aptasia and all that stuff, but you're probably never going to get all of it. Um, you know, there's oh, like Klein's butterflies, copper bands can, you know, people claim to eat them. There's Aptasia eating file fish. The problem with all the peppermint shrimp, the Caribbean ones have never had luck. The Indonesian peppermint shrimp, I have had luck with them. But the, the thing is, is that biocontrols are never going to be 100% besides something like Bergia where they obligately eat Aptasia. So, you know, if you can do Bergia, that's going to be the easiest option. Otherwise, you're going to be cycling through different guys, which may end up eating the coral in the long run. So a little bit of cost-benefit analysis there with dealing with Aptasia. Bare bottom tanks. I love them. Really easy to grow coral. You can have ripping flow. There you go. Um, I still like sand though, right? So I've got a tub of sand on my sump can still have the microbial community associated with the sand, but you don't have to deal with all those problems I talked about earlier to where you can have the distinct microbial community, which is likely to be more pathogenic that is colonizing on the sand, interact with your corals. And you can also have higher flow. So yeah, I run my system's bare bottom, but I still have a tub of sand in the bottom in the sump. And then I also have a cryptic sump. And I'll probably do a deep sand bed that's remote as well. Hmm. 
It seems people are dosing traces, but aren't sure how they're being utilized. Can they build up and cause problems? Probably, right? So there's like a lot of really weird traces people are dosing now to where it's pretty spotty if they actually have any biological usage, like rubidium is one. Like there's, there's probably maybe some use to rubidium, but if you're not doing regular ICP testing when you're doing traces, you probably should be just blindly dosing traces or using any of the trace products to where it's based on like your alkalinity or calcium consumption could be a, a pretty slippery slope and can lead to build up of some, you know, build up of stuff, especially if you're dosing any like the heavy metals or transition metals, like, you know, people are dosing nickel and stuff. Now, if you're doing that without ICP testing, that can be a problem very fast. So anyone doing traces, you really, really want to be consistent with ICP. What about rubble? Like in the tank or yeah, aluminum, zinc, lithium, all can cause problems. I completely agree. Uh, like, do you mean rubble in the tank or like rubble somewhere else? What do you mean, Nathan? Like we're located or you just want to know about my opinions on rubble anyway, like writ large, but uh, I like reborn, you know, calcium reactor media. I'll use that in some spots, right? Like throw in my cryptic sump. Um, I've got some in my sump as well. So, you know, that stuff's great. Can, can maybe buffer things. Who knows? I've seen some systems at shops I've worked at where we just threw in like a ton, a ton. Yep. Yep. Reborn's the stuff, man. That's, that's the best way to do it. If you want rubble for, for media or for a substrate, but yeah, some of the shops I've worked in, we just threw in like a ton of shroom baskets with reborn in it. And we did notice like a little bit better out, you know, pH stability, completely anecdotal though. We might've just been dosing more calc. Who knows? So I don't really know if there's a lot of data behind having larger concentrations of aragonite in the system and having more stable pH, maybe to a certain extent, like a massive amount of it, you know, but not something I've seen a lot of data for. Could be something to experiment with though. So yeah, um, we can go however long. I don't know how much longer Remy wants to go. I'm not really doing whatever tonight. I'm kind of under the weather staying at home. So I can talk if we want to talk about whatever we can end it because it's been an hour. It's uh, up to Remy. So yeah, I could do a uh, final, final questions. If we want to do that, I don't know what Remy's schedule is. Okay. Five to 10 minutes. So drop in your last questions or give me something to go down a rabbit hole on. <laughs> Skylar. <laughs> okay. So yes, I have spoken out against hydrogen peroxide dips in the past under the rationale that I have read some papers that show that using peroxide as a treatment can cause a copious amount of stress in the coral's tissue and can be pretty bad. I also, you know, thinking about it, I like say I don't know about the chemistry as much, but thinking about it, if you're going to use peroxide, it will. I, th I think it would disassociate into a free radical and an aqueous solution, which would be the same thing as having the buildup of free radicals that corals do when they naturally produce peroxide. But I was uh, approached by someone who has a peroxide-based dip, and I was asked to evaluate it and think about it more, and they had a pretty decent counter argument. So I will look into it more. I do not have my final opinion on this, but those are my initial thoughts. Uh, but I have, I started reading some papers today, so I will certainly read some more papers and become more educated on the subject and then give a more informed response. So, yeah, I think that peroxide could be good with like fish and stuff like that. So, yeah. How would you approach a clownfish with a Popeye? The fish is only about two inches long. Oh, geez. Yeah, Popeye can be like a lot of different stuff. I would say that I'm not the guy for that. I'm more coral pathogen stuff. I do not want to ill-advise you on how to treat fish. You talked like Bobby Miller, like humble fish for sure. I so said I could tell you maybe what I think like, you know, off the cuff, but it might not be the right advice for something like that. Yes, I read Sanjay and Richard Ross's ICP article. It is the sauce. I think that uh, we should get them some more money. So we can do a much larger and more in-depth article. So I was talking at the beginning, maybe having a joint crowd crowdfunding effort through Reef Beef and Reef Builders so they can test every ICP company on the market with certified standards and have a sufficient sample size. So it could be like version three of things. Yeah, it was great to meet you, Nick. Thank you for picking up some uh, candy cane. Oh, nice to meet you. I was like, who the hell is that? It took me a second to recognize. I saw the picture. I'm like, oh, okay. KFC dip. 
nah, don't do it. <laughs> I can go, I can go much deeper on that if you want me to. But uh, no, I do not utilize antibiotics, especially not prophylactically, and especially when I do not know what I'm targeting, what dosage to use, or what the contact time is. If uh, you know people that utilize it cannot answer answer those questions, then you know don't dose what you don't test for. Same logic there. Even dosing trace, do you feel confident in getting consistent ICP results? Hearing that sometimes they can be quite a change in ICP results in both ways of how you're packing your samples. Yeah, so that's what I'd like to evaluate, right? I think if we had a, you know, a little bit better funding behind it, we could evaluate those questions to determine which companies were the most accurate based on standards and which ones were consistent based on standards. So I think that that would be pretty worthwhile. I think that kind of the same result that Rich and Sanjay come to, which is if you use the same ICP company consistently, it's the same idea as using like a test, you know, the same test kit. You can probably do something, you know, if you use the exact same one. But in terms of which is the best, we don't really have data to support that. And until people come out and talk about, you know, what machines they use, what the calibration standards are, how they calibrate with salt water, how often they calibrate, we're probably not going to know that information. So, yeah. So, you know, it's an unknown right now, but it's not one we can't figure out. How do you test carbon dosing? Um, are you talking about the community science project thing? So with aquabiomics, the goal is we're going to have different people without UV sterilizers use different carbon sources for like a month, and they will send in a sample to aquabiomics before and after that. So we can see how the microbiome will change in the tank based on that one change of adding a certain carbon source. So our thought is potentially finding a carbon source, which could boost some of the more beneficial uh, bacterial populations in a tank. So that'll be a joint thing between reef builders and aquabiomics that we got sorted out this weekend. So if that's what you're referencing, that's kind of the lowdown on that. We'll have a uh, large, large uh, link to that soon. Let's say you have a mushroom like a bleach one spoken about earlier from the sand bed. Would a bacterial dip be helpful before moving it off the sand bed? How could you nurse it back to health? So what I would do is I would do something like a general antiseptic like iodine. So do iodine because like antibiotics, no, <laughs> right? I've got plenty of stuff about that. So iodine is a general antiseptic. After that, you could then add it somewhere else in the tank off of the sand bed because coral are able to reacquire the, their symbionts in a system. So if you've got a good microbial baseline in your tank already, if you take it off of the sand bed and it's no longer getting interfered with by that external population, it can then reacquire things through the water column and healthily, hopefully become healthy, maybe doing some targeted feedings and get, ensuring that it gets, like, you know, pretty good nutrition at that time would be something. Um, you could, but like I said, there's not really any, there's no probiotics in the market that are really coral associated. Maybe this stuff you could dip it in. You could maybe try to dip in an eco balance, which is like Bacillus subtilis, which could eat Vibrio. But even then, who knows what else is eating in the tank or in, in the microbiome of that coral. So yeah, dips for SPS. I like to use potassium chloride just about for anything. Obviously, when you get SPS, if you're getting wild, you got to go and cut the base because of any eggs that could be down there. But uh, yeah, potassium chloride, I'll basically nuke just about anything, large or small, and just doing regular consistent dips with something like acros. Because if you've got, if you've got you know, flatworms, you'll have the egg cycle to deal with. So doing consistent dips with something like that. A lot of people will use Interceptor in tank. Uh, you know, Bayer is kind of scary to me because it can be carcinogenic. Anything can be carcinogenic, right? But if you're not rinsing something like Bayer, very, very well, then it could potentially be aerosolized by a skimmer. So I would just rather use something more general like potassium chloride that does not have that issue. What can cause the color from frags of SPS to turn brownish, lose color when they, you see them in the shop and drop pop extension? I live in Dallas, have a huge pop extension. Tank, 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 tank is eight month old. I can't talk. Um, yeah, like a, a billion things, <laughs> right? It could be the microbial population. It could be lack of stability in your tank. It could be, you know, not having traces in the correct concentration. It could be a difference in par. It could be too low of par. I would need to know, you know, a lot more information to answer your question, but I would say, look at pH, look at traces, look at the par they had it in, maybe do an aquabiomics test. Those are all good things to do anyways, but it could be a number of those things. If you've had it alive for, for that long and it's got polyp extension, that's good. It could be a par issue. It could be too low of par if it's happy. Um, because it's got polyp extension. So you could maybe try to move it up slowly over time. Par meter is a really good investment. Rent it or, uh, you know, if you buy one. <laughs> yeah, bacon balance is interesting. The thing is, it's a lot of false advertising, at least from what I've experienced anecdotally. So first of all, a polymer that targets only the good bacteria. 
okay, right? I mean, that's any carbon source, most any bacterial species is going to be able to utilize. And, you know, you could have some that maybe some are more competitive at metabolizing than others, but to have just to have grandiose claims like that with no data, and at least anecdotally, when me and several others that I'm close with have used it, we've seen really no, no difference. I think it's probably just a different carbon source, right? I think that many others would have the same effect. Now, this will be one we test with Eli, right? Back to balance is on the list because it does have very impressive claims, but we will then have data to evaluate if it really follows along with that. Yeah, citizen science seems like the best way, at least to us, because we're going to need a pretty substantial sample size. And obviously, because there's not really much control between all the systems out there, it's going to be interesting to see that among that diversity of samples, if we can get something consistent on the other side. So yeah, I mean, sugar, um, vodka, vinegar, bacto balance, no pox, which is methanol. I have successfully used Bellafix for SPS dips, KI also. So actually, I will not say what I was going to say because I might get sued. But one of those is very similar or maybe identical to like five of their dips in the market. I'll tell you that. So yes, that makes sense to me. But uh, yeah, maybe we'll do like uh, two more questions and wrap it up for tonight. I think Remy's got a family and a life outside of this stuff. So he probably needs to go. <laughs> I can stay and talk all night, but alas, people, life, priorities. <laughs> My brain hurts so good. That's like what, what like Ben said. He's like, I listened to back or Salem talking about bacteria and I wanted to quit the hobby. And I was like, oh man, that's not, that's not what I'm going for at all. Talking about Fiji, is there any shops the general public can go to or recommend? Are you talking about in terms of buying Fiji corals? I think a lot of people have been getting them in. I mean, most of the major wholesalers like, you know, um, eye catching, et cetera, are getting into Fiji corals right now. So I think just maybe ask your LFS, tell them to get accounts. I think ACI had some um, on their site. So get an account with like ACI or eye catching or whoever they order from and ask for Fiji corals. <laughs> What can I do if a Ghani starts to close and the polyps never open? I would test your nutrients. Ghanis are really, the, the biggest thing I've, also what par it's at, right? So I've had a lot of success with Ghanis and a little bit lower par, a little bit higher flow. And they, it's weird because they like to ha be fed, right? Not like target fed, but they like to have a lot of nutrition or nutrients in their system. But also, I've had them do better in systems with lower nutrients. This is all completely anecdotal. But like the, the tanks where I've done the best with Ghanis is where I have extremely high nutrient input and then extremely high nutrient output. So the overall nutrient values in the water are low, but they are getting fed a lot. Now, there's the whole manganese bullshit. I think it's bullshit, right? Well, show me some papers. If you show me a paper, I'm open to it. But otherwise, I think it's just important as every other major trace element. Iodine could be equally as important for metabolic function, right? So that just, instead of manganese, get your traces in order, right? So ICP testing and doing traces. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is a litany of scientific literature out there that shows that manganese is extremely important for Ghanis, but no one's told me a mechanism or sent me a paper so far. I'll Google it right now. Let's look right now on Google Scholar. The importance of manganese to Ghanipura. And Ghanis are pretty researched. Ah, the number one source is from Fauna Marine. Hmm. I wonder why that might be. Let's see. There is absolutely nothing peer reviewed. They are... Oh, here we go. Here's one. Let's see. This is... Okay, this is not specific to Ghanis. This is just writ large about manganese as a trace element. So manganese benefits heat stress corals at the cellular level. We do that one. So, right. Obviously, um, you know, adding manganese is good for a lot of different biological and metabolic functions, like, you know, pathways. But is it specifically important for Ghanis more than anything else? Probably not, guys. And I'm sure that, you know, it looks like quite a few vendors on the front page of vendor that sell dry goods have told you that it's very important for Ghanis. So same thing. Nice shirt up here. I'm wearing pajama pants below the table. All things always look, look very, you know, very, very nice. So 
Like I said, there might be anecdote to where manganese is very, very important for Ghanis, and there just aren't any peer-reviewed articles, and there's been a disconnect, like Nick is saying, between the hobby and academia, but at least so far, I know of no data. I think that it makes sense to you know keep in line all of your trace elements, including manganese. So anyways, lower par, make sure they get fed, make sure you got your nutrients in order, trace elements for Ghanis. I've had success that way with them, but uh, yeah. So we'll do one more question, and then we will head out tonight. If we want to go really late, maybe I will go live on my own Facebook. But I don't really know if I want to do that. It also won't be as clean and professional as this. This is like I've got like the lighting. I've got this awesome microphone. It's like ASMR. I can do like – hold on. Oh, that was gross. Ew. <laughs> Yeah, I should do like coral ASMR. I should like frag coral like an inch from the mic. You can hear like the brutality of the bandsaw, water sloshing. 10 hours of coral fragging ASMR to go to sleep in or go to sleep to. <laughs> Too bad I was shipping all day. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're a busy guy, Skylar. You got to ship me some bread, man. Anecdotal evidence is a good stepping stone, but you have to isolate the variables. I expect a lot of traces are just making your water more expensive. I think so too. Like rubidium, nickel, lithium, I don't know. Chromium, I don't know. Maybe, right? But maybe not. I think the big ones are good, right? Iodine, manganese, those make a lot of sense to me. But other ones, eh, maybe just a product. Maybe just a product. I'd like to see data. Wouldn't aragonite sand be a good source um, of what? Sorry, what are you referencing? I mean, some of these things like calcite, aragonite, Live rock, you know, if you got a calcium reactor, that can take care of traces. Tyler, you're a gem to this hobby. Everyone go follow inland underscore reef on Instagram. I met Tyler this weekend. Awesome guy. We're going to be doing some very cool articles for reef builders as well. He's like the mangrove master. So we've been thinking for a while, maybe we could get mangroves to be able to be, you know, propagatable at a node. So you cut it off like you would propagate like a terrestrial plant. And then we use rooting hormones. So we're going to mess around with some cool stuff like that and have an article about it. But yeah. If the ocean has it, why would it not play a role in the health of an ecosystem in a box? I think that that's a good line of logic, right? I think that also you have to consider, though, do we have to add it, at least directly? So and there's a lot of these that come in external to us adding them in a dropper. A lot of balanced foods, you could get these trace elements through. So the question is, just because it does not come up on an ICP test, does, is the coral not getting that element? And I think that's a much harder question to answer. I think that supplementing the majority of you know known traces that have a lot of data behind them with ICP makes a ton of sense to me. But I think the flip side of that is also having very diverse and appropriate nutrition. So uh, yeah, I think that that makes sense. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Maybe there's some data. In Australia, where Ghani is found in large and healthy corals, especially the red Ghani, there's a lot of red iron and manganese rich on the land and upstream from the rivers that dump water in the ocean right at the intro reefs. I believe the water in these locations has been tested, but I know the soil upstream is rich, so it makes sense the river. Now that makes more sense to me. That's great to know. Now that that's awesome. One time on a live stream, I used to sell coral in these auctions. I was completely bullshitting one time, and I was like, I was like, they determined that I was like, I, I think I read somewhere that like they determined that like the rock had more manganese in it or something that the, the Ghanis grew on. But I couldn't remember if like I made that up or if I read it somewhere, but maybe that's true. Yeah. So, you know, that makes a little bit more sense to me that maybe Ghanis have naturally evolved over time, at least Australian Ghanis, to utilize manganese and iron more, right? That, that's great. That's a lot more logical than just the idea of company X says to use manganese. But again, that would follow along with just making sure that all of your traces are in line. If, the, if, the, if that's the case, then you're going to be getting the benefits of Ghani's needing higher concentrations or at least being adapted to higher concentrations of manganese and iron. Why do you have to dose every day to keep levels at if food has them? Well, I'm not saying that the food would... So here's the thing is I think taking a sample from the water is distinct from taking a sample from the coral. So if a coral has already uptaken it, eating it, you know, from a feeding and is utilizes it already as a cofactor and protein production, whatever they utilize it for metabolically, then obviously you would not have that in your water column. 
it's the same concept as like uh, you can't test for the phosphates that are bound in your rock. It's not you know available in solution because it's already being utilized in a system. So if you have if there's food that has some of these more minute trace elements in them and the coral uptake them really rapidly because maybe they are a limiting factor for some metabolic or very niche pathways, then that's not going to be available in solution to test with ICP. That's my logic is if you have something that's in such a minute, minute sample in like, you know, or concentration in the natural ocean, you know, I don't know. Is there a benefit to maintaining that minute of a concentration in the water column if they could be getting it from food? So that's a question to ask and to, to kind of to explore. I don't know the answer to that. It's just rationale I'm utilizing right now. You know, if I see papers about these specific trace elements are good in this concentration and solution, that's a different story, but I have not seen that data. That doesn't mean it's not true, but it does mean that I haven't seen it. I can easily get a water sample of the reef and river system. I've seen it. I've been meeting to it for a while and yeah, do it. That'd be awesome. Yes. That would be awesome. That'd be very interesting actually. Yeah, I would love to see that data for sure. If you could get it, like, are you in Australia? I'm assuming you're in Australia because you said that. If that's the case, if you could get it there, and then if you could get it at a different reef location that maybe does not have as many Ghanis. Obviously, it's not like a great control, but it could give us an idea if that's something that is endemic to one region or if it is distinct you know, because of that river in particular or runoff or something like that. <laughs> this is turned into the Meckley and I trace element debate. Okay. We have a cheap balance for three weeks straight while dosing all MNT. Did everything start to become deficient and amounts has let it increase? Okay, hold up. I got to read what you're saying here. Everything starts to become deficient and amounts had to be increased to keep levels balanced. Okay. So that is a little bit more persuasive to me. If you notice that they began to decline after you were dosing them, then something's utilizing them, right? Is it the coral? Maybe. Is it, uh, you know, coralline algae, any of the microfauna? I mean, bacteria can use these things too. Is it important for a system and is it necessary for coral growth is my question. So I think that that's a little bit better than just the baseless claims of you need to dose this, right? So if you at least have a, had experiential knowledge or, you know, anecdotal of, not anecdotal, but yeah, experiential to where you are dosing it and you see a trend where there's decline the more you dose it, you know, if it correlates with calcification, that's a little bit more persuasive to me that it could be coral utilizing it, but it also could be coralline algae, right? There could be many things that, you know, utilize a process of calcification that could be utilizing these trace elements that are not coral. I have just not seen data to show there is a one-to-one -one connection between coral utilizing these trace elements. And maybe I haven't dug deep enough. I have data, water data from this region. I don't have much data from the Southern Queensland reef system yet, though. That'd be cool. If you've got time, if you've got the cash, like all the major collecting sites in Australia and having like a list of the coral from those regions and then having like the ICP data from those regions as well, that'd be very interesting to see. Like what's Western Aussie look like, right? Like what like Darwin and stuff like that. That's like Northern, I think, right? Like it'd be cool to see if there's a distinction in the different, um, in the trace element concentrations in those waters. That'd be cool to have like a super biotope, like only Western Aussie corals and keep the traces of the concentrations that are endemic to that region. Okay, there you, there you go. Looks like there's a lot of anecdote that magnes or manganese is important. I think though that manganese is important writ large for all corals, right? So I think that could be true with a lot of corals, but it seems that if manganese you know, has, is more prevalent or in higher concentration from runoff, like, you know, Shane says, then that makes sense that they've might utilize higher concentrations of it. So Ghani's in particular would suffer from low iron and manganese. We're all learning things, right? I don't know. I I've not, I've not heard of this before. So this is an interesting dialogue. Now we know. The amount dose we dialed in and they then started to decrease the amount had to be increased. Okay. So, what what is like what is the list of things that you are dosing right like is rubidium on there lithium like what what of like the weird more niche things are you dosing that's my question because because yeah if you're seeing a direct one-to-one -one correlation of an increase in consumption that is pretty persuasive to me i just don't know if i've seen that with i think the way to do it this would be like a decent way to test this 
would be to set up a bunch of tanks and only dose one trace element, like one of the minor elements over time and see if you can get, like maintain the big three, right? Like maintain all of your macro elements, but then dose one trace element at a time and then see if you could get uh, consumption to increase or see if it would begin to decrease in concentration and have a completely sterile tank with one coral in the tank. That would be a, a much more scientific or interesting way to answer these questions. And then you only dose rubidium and then you see, okay, do corals actually utilize rubidium? At least does this species of coral utilize rubidium, like acros or like you feel like, you know, femorphilia, like some hammers, those with things that would be more interesting that are common among all, you know, that are, that are pretty common in the hobby. I think that'd be good. Wow. What was 10 times higher than what we know it should be? That's interesting. Hmm. I wonder if when there's higher runoff, if there's a higher growth rate for the Ghanis, right? If they really do utilize um, manganese and iron in higher concentrations naturally because they've just evolved in that region over time. That'd be cool if like during the wet season, when there's more runoff, you get a fat, you get like a, a growth spurt in the Ghanis. Hmm. We need to get aims on this. Someone, someone tag Kevin in the chat. We need to see if rainfall correlates to Ghani growth in Australia. Let's see. What brand is better? I bought a few rounds of ATI trace elements. Lithium seemed to be better. One, the dose, one would send an IPP, ICP. We do not have the data for that yet. Every company is going to claim they're the best. Um, again, I would like to have like a dual funding thing that's like crowdfunded through Reef uh, Beef and Reef Builders. So we can do like the same Sanjay Rich article, but try every single company multiple times with standards. Sure. I, I know. Yeah, they, they definitely agree with you that they all play a role in the health of the corals. But my question is just, do they uptake every single one of these, right? Is it, the, is it actually the coral that is uptaking these specific nutrients, right? We can dose rubidium in our system, but is it the coral that's utilizing rubidium? That's my question. And I think that you'd be able to see that through a controlled test like that to where you see if the coral directly uptakes that specific minor trace element. So yes, well, all of them together are important for health. If they are uptaken by the coral, I at least have not seen exact data that show the corals uptake them. Anecdotally, experientially, we can see that, but also there is a multitude of other organisms in our systems that could use them too. So maybe I'll set it up. I might do it. I've got a bunch of these spare little tanks. I'll do like some critter keepers. I'll do like autoclaved sterile water. I'll do one piece of coral in each and I'll do a minor trace in each and I'll have the same par on all of them. I'll just have like an air stone in each. So like with the same air pumps, that's the same amount of like oxygen or flow. And then I can do it over like a week. Like that'd probably be enough time to see uptake. And then I can dose like, um, I don't even know if I need to dose macro elements then. And since if we have like, if I have one piece of coral in a gallon, depends on how big a piece of coral that is. Um, yeah, here's my experimental design. I'm, I'm brainstorming right now. I mean, someone, someone send reef builders some money and we'll do it. <laughs> we'll do this huge, like, do corals utilize this minor trace element study? Sample size of one, very scientific. We'll have controls too, but that's someone that has some cash. They could do that. I think that'd be pretty interesting. Okay, there's like a trillion things in the chat. You got to start highlighting things for me, Remy. There you go. Send me some coral, Skylar. Yep. Yeah, I've got an autoclave at the lab. I don't know if I'm technically supposed to use it because it's the schools, but <laughs> I'll probably buy an autoclave for myself eventually. Now that is more likely. I can see that because there's plenty of data showing that a lot of uh, different marine bacteria can utilize these trace elements. So that's interesting to me. And that'd be something to test. So then... Uh, Okay. Okay. So now, now we can expand this experimental design, right? We can have monocultures of all of the known symbionts and then s try different minimal medias and see, add different minor trace elements and see if we get more optimal growth. That'd be interesting. That's going to be like way too much money and time for anything that reef builders uh, or even the hobby has access to, but it's something that could be done. Great chat, Chris. Thank you. I like having discussions where people challenge my thoughts. 
I like the back and forth. Raj did that once. Everyone said I hated Raj. I don't hate Chris. <laughs> Just as preempting that. Let's see. I worked in a lab that tested human vitamins. A lot of those were not biologically available to humans. You immediately peed them out. Very expensive urine. Yes. Yeah. So that's my thought is, are the coral utilizing them? If the microbiome utilizing them, that makes a lot more sense. I mean, there's fungi, there's fungi, there's archaea. There's so much wacky stuff that can utilize different, you know, chemicals that other things might not. So you never know. But if someone wants to send reef builders like a, a million dollars, then I can finish my degree and I would gladly set up everything to do this. So if we've got any philanthropists or donors out there that are secret in the chat that just like have never had their name out there and they want to give people money to explore these really wacky questions, well, I'd be happy to set it up <laughs> and I can write a big article about it. So, but uh, yeah, I think we've got like 30 minutes over. We had like a really good chat there for everyone, but uh, thanks for the conversation. I'm, I can still go if you want to Remy, but I don't know if Remy wants to stay on any later. We said five to 10 minutes and it's been 30 more minutes. So <laughs> yeah, but we had some great discussions about trace elements and, the community science stuff. There's been a lot of stuff. King of DIYs on here. That's badass. He's. I watched your YouTube channel. I was like a kid. I didn't even see your name until now. That's awesome. That's like a. It's like a nerd like meeting a celebrity moment for me. That's so cool. I was like 12 watching his channel. I know I look 12 now, but like I was actually 12. Um, I graduate in May, so I'll have a degree in molecular biology and biotechnology with a minor in chemistry, and then. I talked to some people at Reefstock that had doctorates and are studying coral. And with some alcohol and a lot of time, they really convinced me that I should go pursue a doctorate. So I think I'm going to pursue a doctorate and hopefully get into like an applied microbiology program. There is a really interesting one at Oregon State to where, you know, it's like applying microbiology to coral. So it's everything I'm researching basically right now. Um, I could also maybe go to Australia. That'd be an option too. I got to get like a re really good GRE score to get in these places, but I'm going to study for it. So that'll be like my uh, two-year plan is probably make some money and keep doing this stuff and being a part of the industry and trying to be transparent. And then I'll gear up for grad school and move to some crazy place, probably on a coast and study coral and maybe make a living off of that and be in academia. <laughs> I have not taken the GRE. He's, he's completely lying. He's fabricating all of this. I need to take it though. But uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in everyone. Holy shit, look at that. We got money. Wow, thank you so much. That's awesome. Freshwater is awesome. I've got some freshwater too as well. But um, yeah, I think freshwater would be cool. I want to do discus again. I used to, I started with freshwater. I used to do it all. I have... Um, a little five gallon. I bred um, tiger endlers and cobra guppies like three years ago. So it's like F20 at this point, but they've like, it's like really conserved where like the, the cobra guppy pattern is completely on the tiger endlers like body. Really nice. So I liked messing around with breeding at one point. I had a bunch of like the, like epistogrammas and stuff like that. So if I did it again, I'd probably do like a big black water biotope, have discus, have a bunch of dwarf like, you know, Central or South American cichlids, and then also attempt to have Neocardinia in there just to have, like, if I had like enough leaf litter or had it planted enough, I could probably get away with some and then get like a, have like a bunch of Daphne I'd add and stuff. I'd run it like a reef tank and have like a whole like, um, like microbiome or not microbiome, like ecosystem. Oh man. Thanks. Thanks, man. That's awesome. <laughs> Wow, we broke the record on this stream. We got $75 last week because I drank a lot of alcohol. I didn't even have to sell myself this time. That's awesome. Thank you so much, man. Well, we can put it towards the ICP article. Time to send out some more ICP tests. I'll tell Sanjay. <laughs> I've never actually done African cichlids. I never did them. For some reason, they were boring to me. I think because I had already seen salt water. So I was like, this is like salt water, but like less, I guess. But I, I think I would go back and do Africans now because they're a lot more interesting to me than I, like just like as a kid. Because like as a kid, I was like, oh, it's the aesthetics only, you know? And for whatever reason, I liked like Green Terrors and uh, Jack Dempsey's and stuff a lot more than the Africans. But I think I would do Africans now. I think, it, yeah, I don't have the right ones. Yeah, I've seen like the OBP cocks and stuff like the really, really high grade ones are crazy. 
I think I would do like a little like like a nano with the shell dwellers and stuff. That'd be cool to do. Someday I will have a tank or have a house that will be filled with tanks. I have a grand vision of all of these spe like specific little niche biotopes and things. I don't have the money nor the room right now, but someday I will have the most bitchin like a house of an aquarium. Aquarium of a house. My house will be a public aquarium is what I'm saying. So that's the goal. Oh, man. Do you want to end it, Remy, or do you want to keep going? Oh, my God. Another $100, man. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, is that Grant, like, who does all the shrimp? He's awesome. I think I'm friends with him on uh, for the two beers. <sighs> Am I being told to drink right now? Is this happening again? Oh, no. That's not good. Well, I don't think I could do that. I, look, I'm sick right now. I can't do that tonight. I'm not going to drink tonight, but next week I will drink. But I am sick right now. I had a pretty pretty high fever yesterday. Okay, inside joke. Good. <laughs> I got paid to drink last week, and I drank way too much on the stream. So I thought it was that again. Yeah, I need to get some – I want to get some, like – of the Sulwasi shrimp, like the endo freshwater ones that like I have a, like a higher pH is required. I've wanted to try those for a while. I did like, you know, red pintos and stuff, black pintos for a while. That was like as nice as I went in terms of the shrimp, but I'd probably try. Um... Oh my God. This is awesome. Thank you, man. Look, I don't, look, I, I know I'm subscribed to your YouTube channel. If you got a Facebook, I'm going to have to follow it. I feel obligated to shout you out like in every way I can now. I don't have a large following or platform, but I've got a lot of reef people. So that's really cool. I used to watch your channel a lot. This is this is awesome. Thank you, man. Yeah, I think a lot of people probably got sick after reef stock. I think there was a little super cluster that developed there for sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I feel a lot better today. I've been drinking like electrolytes all day. Took some vitamin C. Made myself a steak, like a really cheap steak, but I made chimichurri. So like, you know, it made it taste better. Steak and eggs with chimichurri, like bottom shelf steak. It's like the college way to like feel like you're eating nice. A lot of protein. All right. Remy, do you want to keep going or not? It's up to you. You let me know. I can start going on tangent and stuff. We've just kind of been coasting here, but I can just, I can talk about anything. The Meckley ICP stuff was fun. Someone's got a hot take. Let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, that seems like a pretty good metric. I never got to meet Jake, which uh, which was unfortunate. I feel like I would have really liked him. You know, I always well, I watched his content growing up a lot, but I never got to meet him, unfortunately. Yeah, how many systems do you have, Joey? You've got, you've got quite a few, don't you? I mean, I know you do, but like, how, do you have an exact number? Anyone want to talk about DMSP? Who would have been the one talking? Probably Jake. I would have shut up and listened. <laughs> I would not have tried to interrupt him. He was the godfather, man. All right. I'm going to go on a tangent about dimethyl sulfonylpropionate. So DMSP. It's produced by the zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae, when they're stressed out, um, due to a number of different things, could be heat. Heat stress is the most common ones. This is you know common during bleaching. But it can happen a lot of other ways too. But they will produce this as a byproduct through a couple different pathways. So like, I think one theoretical pathway is that it happens from heat shock proteins being activated. So it's cleaved off and released. So typically DMSP is metabolized by known beneficial symbionts in the holobiont. Examples are endozoicomonas and roseobacter. So they will metabolize DMSP and convert it into a sulfur-based antibiotic, which is then utilized to regulate the population of the holobiont and keep all the opportunistic bacteria at the proper populations. They do not overrun the coral and become pathogenic. So basically it is a, it, it first is utilized as a way to produce the main regulatory factor 
that the regulatory top level good guys use to control the rest of the coral's microbiome. That's one. Two, when those core symbionts are gone due to a stress event, they die off, the DMSP will build up in concentration. And that is very bad because a lot of known coral pathogens have evolved to chemotaxis directly or chemokinesis, but they'll, they'll move directly to DMSP concentrations. So basically what happens is you will have a sick coral from abiotic stress. The zooxanthellae will produce DMSP because of that abiotic stress. The good guys that eat DMSP and make it into useful chemicals die. So then A, you don't have those useful chemicals. So the natural microbiome of the coral becomes imbalanced and those guys start to grow out of control. And instead of helping the coral, they utilize it as, as a food source. So that's one, that's internal dysbiosis. And then two, DMSP will then build up in concentration and external pathogens. So your vibrios have evolved to detect DMSP in the water column and they will then travel to the coral. So it's like vultures circling a prey and they're able to directly translocate to an injured and stressed out coral. So then you have this double whammy of an internal dysbiotic event to where the typical good bacteria that are being reg down regulated in population growth by DMSP derived antibiotics then grow in proportion and begin to eat the coral and utilize it as a food source. And then external pathogens come in and they eat the coral too. So then the coral has to deal with both issues at once. A lot of free radicals are produced and then that causes bleaching on top of it. So it's a little bit of a linchpin, I think. Definitely a linchpin in all of this, but it's it's what's known as an infochemical. So a chemical that you know creates information, you know, or provides information in this instance. In this instance, it's the pathogens coming towards the coral. But um, I, there are other infochemicals, which is a lot of what my research deals with: is putting coral mucus into gas chromatography chromatography machines when they're stressed, and seeing if there are things that elevate versus when they are not. And I think that there are a lot of infochemicals out there that are not being talked about and are in fact being pushed as products to you right now. And I will not say what those products are, but I will tell you that there are likely a number of products on the market that many of the largest people use in the hobby and they swear by it. But in fact, they are infochemicals that likely pathogens will translocate to, meaning if the coral absorb them, the same thing as DMSP can occur. And I think that that is alarming. Okay, what do you reckon to stop it, remove it to quarantine? So yeah, DMSP is naturally produced by the zooxanthellae dur during times of stress. So minimizing that stress is very important. Also having a, a the correct microbiome is going to be very important. So having those core symbionts that metabolize DMSP and maintaining them is very, very important. So when people get in coral from overseas and they dip them in antibiotics, they're wiping the good guys out. The coral stressed out even more. And after that, it's just, uh, you know, it's a matter of time. So that's one of the primary reasons I am against antibiotics is simply because even if you can take out the bad, you're likely only, you're also taking out the good. So that's the whole chasing stability thing. But um, yeah, I'm 22, about to turn 23. I look 15, but also I have a receding hairline. So it's a little bit of like this weird duality. My hair is aging faster than my face. So I'm going to look pretty wacky when I'm like 30. So it depends, right? So what I like to do when I receive coral is let them chill for like a couple days. So I'll put them in a quarantine tank or even a pre-quarantine system. Let them chill. Don't dip them at all. Just let them get acclimated to try to hopefully have the bacteria decrease those concentrations of DMSP and other infochemicals, other ones too. Um, and then after that, dip them and transfer them to like a dedicated quarantine tank. Cause obviously there can be macroscopic pests. You'll have flatworms. You'll have bugs of different types. So those can be problems. But um, the, the first thing is you want to decrease the stress associated with the travel time as soon as you get the coral. So letting them chill, then dipping them, then holding them, and then eventually transferring them to grow out. You know, that's kind of in my pathway and I've had a lot of success with that. Hairless talk. <laughs> oh no. I guess I can shave it all. I might as well just get ahead of it. All the men on my mom's side and my dad's side, completely bald. 
there are there is not high hopes for me. There's like all of that crazy like red light treatment stuff they have for hair growth. I guess I could get a transplant. Maybe by the time I'm like 40, technology will have like advanced enough to where I can keep my hair. But um, I, I don't have high hopes. I think I might be rocking a toupee or just have like the sprung style, you know? Yeah, the camera ages me. Yeah, I met you. I met you, Travis, didn't I? I believe I took a picture with you, correct? Here, let me plug in my computer very quickly. My computer has a low battery warning, but my charger's right here. Do they work? Have you noticed um, any advantages to the red light? Maybe I should do it. Maybe I should go on Amazon. How much are these things? I feel like I probably should not get an Amazon one. I feel like there's probably a better one to get. Red light therapy for hair. Oh my God, this one's $2,000. I'm going to have to sell a lot of coral. This one's a, this one's $100. That seems a, a little bit more practical for my budget right now. It probably won't work though. <laughs> Capillus. That's such a funny name. It's like Bacillus, like the bacteria. Let's see it. Capillus. Capillus cap. Oh yeah, the the twelve the two thousand dollar one. That's that's the one you have. Okay. Well, if it works, it works. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, if you guys want to get me a Capillus hat, that would be awesome. I would be, I'd be much appreciated. I do not need that though. I would, if if you feel like sending money, I'd much much rather have that money go towards uh, research, the community science stuff we talked about. I would be glad to lose my hair if we can learn some answers about you know our biggest questions in the hobby for sure. So, my leopard gecko has a red light. I've got an infrared bulb. You got an infrared T5 bulb on my hybrid setup. I guess I get standard of that. And the UVA, UVB bulbs right there too. So I could just get cancer, but maybe my hair will grow. Melanoma and hair growth, you know, two in one special. Let's see. <clears throat> I want to know these things we might be using that might be creating the issues. Um, I don't want to get sued. I'll leave it at that. I do not want to make people mad because these products are very, very good sellers. And there's also not completely concrete data behind this stuff. There's a couple papers that exist, all of which are peer reviewed, which is alarming because people are adding this to their tank in gallons. But it is a very hot topic issue right now. And I don't want to just uh, take on the industry as a 22 year old and piss off every manufacturer out there. You, if you listen to me enough, you will likely, through process of you know elimination, pick up on what these products are because I will state which products I do not use when people ask me if I use them. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be the way to do it, yes. I will likely have a much larger article about this, which is screened by the editors, so we can avoid these potentially legal issues because it is something I think should be talked about and there should be information about. That was my neighbor's upstairs. Apartment complex. That or something fell in here, but I hope not. Hopefully nothing fell in here. But uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's going to be a lot of articles. I'll have one this week about, you know, disputing the whole concoction thing people are pushing. I think it's dangerous. It'll also examine data behind ammonia dosing. I will have an interview with Jason about the algae turf scrubber since this data is really interesting. I want to show people that. We're going to have a very, very large video or article with Aquabiomics with the collaboration for the Community Science Project for Carbon Dosing. Um, on top of that, I will also have an article about full spectrum lighting and kind of chasing the sun and the idea of the, um, like the sunblock theory of pigment development in coral. So I'll have that. Maybe I will have um, an article about some trace elements and this whole experimental design thing I just got in the discussion with Meckley about. That might be a cool one too. <laughs> yeah, sure. But um, I think this will make people a lot, a lot more mad than just saying they have a shitty pump. You know what I mean? This is this is challenging every single manufacturer and saying one of the best sellers on the market can actually probably kill coral. And that's a pretty big, 
it's a pretty hot button issue that I'd like to get right instead of just talking about it willy nilly. There's plenty of things that I would like to go and I can just talk about like DMSP, for instance, things like that, that a lot of people don't talk about, but that one could have some pretty big ramifications. I would like to get right. And I think delivery will be very important, but it keep, you know, it'll be here, but also, yeah, we're going to have a very big announcement with uh, some of my research for this coming month. So stay tuned for that too. That's all I'll say about it, but it'll be very, very good. So I think you will all gain something from it. Um, I think culturing bacteria without aseptic practice is very dangerous. And people have been pushing for that like the last month now. And that's pretty scary. That's really scary. Taking a rich nutrient source and inoculating it with anything and everything. And then also having environmental contamination. That is very scary. <laughs> that's probably the scariest one right now. Uh, behind that is prophylactic antibiotic use. I think that's also a very big problem. Resistance is a Obviously, there's a you know a lot of data behind that. I think it's already begun happening in the hobby. So, culturing bacteria, antibiotic use, some of these other products I'm talking about that I'm alluding to. I think. Hmm, what else do I think could be bad? <laughs> the red field ratio is a lie. <laughs> so people chasing that, I think it could be problematic as well. Uh, that's not as bad as the other ones though. But that's just kind of like a probably not the best. Uh, place to keep your nutrients at. Excuse me. It's kind of gross. Sorry. Didn't mean to burp on here. My God. I guess I'm just human though. But uh, yeah, this has been, this has been the state of the hobby. So I wore my, wore my thing. All of you chose to watch me instead of the president of the United States, which is crazy to me. That's awesome. <laughs> so I hope everyone's had a really good time when we learned something and we've had some good discussions here tonight. Usually we'll have like a lot, um, fair enough. Yeah. Usually we'll have like a lot more structure to this, but because we missed last week's episode and we were at reef stock, I wanted to just kind of recap <clears throat> and talk about things. But, uh, yeah, next week we will have, uh, some fun events. So typically what I do is I'll have like a tier list where I'll rank like all the named Zoas or like all the named acros and stuff like that. So we'll have like, basically it's structured like a, here is like all of the stuff that was on Reef Builders this week. B, here's like a hot topic that I have that I want to talk about. C, here's like a fun tier list. And then D, here's just like community discussion and response. And we just have questions, which is like a lot of what this was tonight. But it's a more chill night. I'm sick. I thought it'd be fun. I think it went well. So yeah, probably need to talk a little. Do I need to talk slower? I get excited and I talk fast. I just rattle off these ideas. Do I talk too fast for people? I'd like to obviously improve my performance here talking about things. So um, if anyone – we'll take like the last two minutes here. Those four. Two minutes here. And if anyone has feedback for how I can better present this, I'm very open to that. I'm not going to get butt hurt or, or like call you a jerk or anything. I would like to have uh, constructive criticism to improve this because I'd like to be better as a, you know, educator, basically. Talk faster. I can talk faster. <laughs> That's so funny. Am I talking too slow then? Is it too slow? Yes, I saw you, Than. I don't think I got a chance to meet you, though. It's very – so nice to meet you. I'm Salem Clemens. Here's the digital interaction. But um, I didn't get a chance to meet you. It was a very busy show. I didn't get a chance to meet a lot of people, actually, that I wanted to meet. But Reef Builders and I had a booth and a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yeah, typically we have a little bit more – structure to this, but this is a little bit more free form. So I definitely understand. Okay. I can certainly talk about abbreviations and explain them first. That's a good one. That's when I often kind of over, you know, I oversight. Okay. Um, so if that's, if that's the case, Matt, I think, you know, if, um, if someone has a question about what I'm saying, then please ask. So if you are not understanding the concept in it, you know, particularly well, then ask, say, it's like, say, Hey, could you reword that? Or could you explain this better? And I will try to then explain it a little bit better way because sometimes I am more technical and just copy paste the explanation of a paper here instead of applying it to the hobby. And that's an issue that I do have a problem with, but if there's feedback in those instances in the live saying, Hey, how did, why does this matter in terms of the coral I keep in my tank? Or could you explain that better? I can, you know, step back and try to do that. So 
I can certainly do that, but also that requires input from all of you, which would be beneficial. So yeah, yeah, we play, we do it every Thursday. Um, we've had very minimal advertisement so far. We wanted to kind of get the format right and get a feel for things, which I think we're getting there for sure. But uh, I appreciate the kind words. Oh, Barb Title Gardens Barbecue. I would like, I would love to tour the facility. We could do a bunch of Reef Builders content there. We could do a bunch of Title Gardens content there. Barbecue sounds great. I'm from Kansas City, so I can uh, I can maybe supply some things, you know. I don't really know how, how good Ohio barbecue is, but uh, Kansas City's got it going on. The Texas pit stuff is pretty good, though. I will say that. Like uh, Texas brisket, like the pits, pit fire stuff, like in a super small town. They have a pit at like 3 in the morning. They just keep it going all day. That stuff's pretty – that is really good barbecue. But I like – I like the ribs better from Kansas City, for sure. But, you know, Austin kind of has some, like, Franklin's and stuff I'd like to try for sure, you know. I like the white sauce from, like, the, what's that, Carolina, right? The kind of vinegar-based stuff. I do like that. I think if you had Kansas City barbecue, skip the dry rub, and you put, like, white sauce on it, that could be really interesting. Like a fusion, regional fusion barbecue. Yes, I am sick today. I probably sound pretty congested. I had a fever, really high fever. I've been in bed the last couple of days. What do I have for tanks? Not as much as you. I've got a six foot, four foot, and a two by two cube all plumbed together. That's my primary grow out. So on there, I have different lights. So same parameters, different spectrum of lighting to experiment with that. So I've got a Halide T5 combo with Reef Brights, then 8-bulb ATI dimmable with Reef Brights, and then Radeon G4, because that's the best spectrum-wise, with T5s and Reef Brights. That's the, that system. I've got a little 5-gallon freshwater tank to where I breed the guppy Indler hybrids, and I've got a ton of Java Boss. I've got a 40-gallon Innovative Marine all-in-one, one of the cubes which I use as a quarantine tank. I've got a 10 gallon innovative marine all in one, which is like a little mini display with just like weird stuff. I've got some sponges in there that I, there were hitchhikers I've grown. So just like little weird guys I like to grow. And then I have a Fluval Flex, I believe. It's one of the 15 or 20 gallon ones. It's not the huge one at the bow front. And it's a, um, it's a jelly tank. So I've got brown jelly in there and I continue to feed the jelly specimens to keep it alive because you can't actually culture all of the microbes that are associated with jelly writ large in a polymicrobial culture because a lot of them are unculturable. So to have enough samples for my research at the university, I have to um, propagate brown jelly. <laughs> so I've got a, a death tank. I throw brown jelly in and I keep it going. So those are the tanks I have right now. I've also got a lot of house plants and then I grow pods and phyto. I need to get some bigger tanks though. I think I might get some troughs. I'm in a little apartment on the ground floor. So Whenever like management comes in, they're like, what the hell? Because my whole living room is just tanks that are all connected and the whole wall is tanks. So I need to probably get a bigger space or something um, eventually and really expand. I've got a lot of tanks I'd like to do. I'd love to do like a large discus display tank that's planted or planted. That'd be beautiful. Like I'm imagining like two peninsulas back to back. One's a full on like SPS tank and then one's discus and have this contrast of like the highest end from both worlds. Yeah, the brown jelly tank's fun, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> You're king, that's so funny. Um, I've slowly, so A, I've been financially irresponsible. <laughs> that's number one. I'm better about that now. Um, two, I have... I know I sell a lot of coral. So all the coral that I sell, Fido I sell, pods I sell, I just reinvest. So I'll reinvest back in. Um, I also trade a lot uh, for sure as well. So like all the equipment I have, I pretty much have traded high-end coral for, things like that. I typically don't buy things outright anymore. I can just get whatever coral or fish or whatever through trading what I've grown. So it's, it's a little, you know, like a self-sustaining hobby right now. But the initial investment, I was not very smart about. <laughs> not at all. Definitely um, some financial irresponsibility there, which I will admit. But it's better now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 
Yeah, fan Joey watch. That'd be that'd be great. Like a, a live stream between you two. That'd be very, very popular, I think. The like two very large platforms combining them. A lot of followers between the two of you. Oh, what? Like like what you wear? This must be some lore I'm unaware of. <laughs> Yeah, that's very true. You uh, you cut corners while you can to buy the rainbow splice. That's exactly what you do. Bottom shelf toilet paper, bottom shelf paper towels, bottom shelf ingredients to cook with. You spend the money on supplements and protein to work out and some high-end coral. That's what I've been doing. Also, I like to eat out. Sometimes I, I will spend money on a good dinner sometimes. I like to try new foods. Someday I'd like to try a Michelin star restaurant and see if there's actually something about it. Someday. I hope I hope I will make enough money or have disposable income enough to eat at some places like that. I really am interested in food culture. <laughs> Vanessa, you I, I need blinds here. I live in Topeka, Kansas. I'm right on the road that drives to the hospital. So any type of person that's been in a homicide typically goes there. Sometimes some gang uh, members have been taken and there'll be like a, a falling car shooting at the ambulance. There's been some crazy stuff right here, right by my house. So I like to keep blinds. Also, there's a lot of break-ins. What was the most exciting thing about Denver? There was a lot about Denver that I really liked. Getting to see the studio was awesome. Being inspired by Kevin and Andrew and Eli to pursue a doctorate that that really changed a lot in my life and was honestly very exciting to walk out of that experience and say, I really am passionate about this. I really do love this and I'm going to do it. So that was more of a personal thing for me. That was a big one. I think um, another one that was very exciting was getting to meet everyone. So there's all these people I've had like on the Facebook verse for years now that I've interacted with, but I've never got to meet them. So talking to all of them was uh, was great like it was basically like the reef beef podcast like the description of the intro but happening so being back at the hotel and like you know drinking with everyone eating food staying up to like 4 a.m and talking to chris meckley about coral that was really exciting but also i think uh, getting to meet all of you so there's a lot of people that are actually probably on this live stream right now that i got to meet and talk to and um that was that was great so i think that's a great place to end it we usually only go for an hour. We've been going for two hours now. So uh, that was that was it. You know, that's that, that, I think that's where we should end things is um, how what I took from Reefstock. So it was the nostalgia of the studio, the inspiration to pursue my own goals, the connections of everyone in the industry, and the connections that I got to make with all of you. That's what I took from Reefstock. And now Chris Meckley's back. <laughs> But uh, I appreciate you all tuning in tonight for the extra long one. It was a lot of fun. Make sure to tune in next Thursday and we can all hang out. We'll have some fun interactive games. But uh, I appreciate appreciate you guys all showing up. And I really appreciate you for donating, Joey. That was awesome. I like Thank you so much. That will go towards some research and some articles. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. Have a good night.